On behalf of the Inter Commission on Human Rights, I want to warmly welcome all of you who are present for this hearing and to particularly welcome the petitioners who are acting on behalf of Mr. Kevin Cooper um, and to also welcome the representatives of the United States who are responding. Um, this case, this particular hearing, is in relation to a case in which the Commission will issue a merits report. Um, it involves the petitioner Kevin Cooper, um, who is the subject of precautionary measures. Um, he is a death row inmate in the state of California, and the Commission granted precautionary measures in 2001 and admitted uh, its adopted its admissibility report in sorry 2011 and admit adopted its admissibility report in the same year um, no doubt um, the attorneys for the petitioner mr tom norman hale and katie dewitt will give us some basic information about his case and will share with us some of their key arguments on the merits uh, this is a case in which we have heard from the petitioner um, on the merits, their observations, but we are awaiting a response from the United States, and this hearing is an opportunity um, to receive those comments. The Commission has closely followed the case of persons on death row throughout the Americas. Um, as you may well know, most are in the United States. The United States is the only country in the region recently to have um, executed persons. Um, we issued a report in 2012 on the situation relating to the death penalty, and we continue to treat with great urgency um, both applications for precautionary measures and petitions filed on behalf of persons on death row. I wish to give um, the attorneys for the petitioners um, an opportunity to share their arguments and their brief synopsis of the case with the Commission. Welcome. Thank you very much. Honorable members of the Commission, thank you very much for granting this hearing. My name is Norman Heil. I'm an attorney from California, and with me is Katie DeWitt, who is working with me on the case. For the Commission's information, we have this case pro bono. We are not being paid. I'd like to begin with a statement from our client, the petitioner, recorded last Wednesday at San Quentin Prison in California. The state would not permit Mr. Cooper to speak to you live via Skype or to appear by a video recording. The state would only allow him to make an audio recording. And therefore, we will now play that audio recording that was made last Wednesday. Honorable members of the commission, I, Kevin Cooper, am speaking to you from death row at San Quentin Prison. For the past 30 years, I have been a victim of repeated violations of my human rights. This nightmare began in June 1983 when I learned that I was being shot for multiple murders that I did not commit. As the surviving victim told numerous people in the days and weeks following the crime, the attackers were three white men. But once the sheriff and the district attorney's office learned that I, a black man, an escaped convict had been hiding at a ranch through the crime scene. They immediately stopped trying to locate the three white men. Instead, they pursued one racist goal, convicting a black man, that black man being me. A monkey hanging effigy outside the courthouse said it all. It bore the sign, hang the nigger. My attorneys have explained to me that it is not your job to determine my innocence or to second guess how the U.S. courts have acted in my case. I understand that you are to decide whether my international human rights have been violated. Please read my papers 
and look closely at the evidence presented. If you do, I'm sure you will see that I, Kevin Cooper, have been prosecuted because of my race. That I, Kevin Cooper, have been denied a fair trial. That I, Kevin Cooper, have been denied due process and a right to an effective defense. That I, Kevin Cooper, have been denied my freedom. Worst of all, in February 2004, I, Kevin Cooper, came within three hours and 42 minutes of being denied my right to life until an emergency state granted me a temporary reprieve. The state of California almost killed me then. The state of California still wants to kill me now. But you can save my life. You have the power to tell the United States that my conviction and death sentence violated international law. You can tell the governor of California that I should not be executed. You can tell Governor Jerry Brown that I need a new trial, a fair trial, a trial free of human rights violations, and a trial free from governmental interference. I respectfully ask you to help me get a trial so that I may finally prove my innocence, freeing myself from 30 years of bondage at the hands of the state. Sincerely and respectfully, this is Kevin Cooper. Members of the commission, as you in and the commission have recognized in the past, death is different. As the commission has recognized on numerous occasions, the irrevocable and irreversible nature of the death penalty warrants a particularly stringent need for reliability in determining whether a person is responsible for a crime that carries the penalty of death. And I'm quoting there from two of the Commission's decisions, one entitled Sankofa and the second Telugu's, and we'll refer to those as we go through today. Given these precedents, we ask that the Commission apply a heightened level of scrutiny to Mr. Cooper's claims of violations of his international human rights. Significantly, the courts in the United States have not considered whether Mr. Cooper's human rights under the American Declaration have been violated. Therefore, this commission is not constrained by decisions or findings of the courts of the United States. You may decide whether Mr. Cooper's human rights under the American Declaration have been violated. The first violation we want to discuss is that of Article Two, and that would be racial discrimination. As the Commission has recognized in its Andrews decision, a reasonable appearance of racial bias by state decision makers implicates the protections of Article II. As we have shown in our petition and in our merits brief, and as Mr. Cooper just told you, the San Bernardino County Sheriff Department and District Attorney violated Mr. Cooper's right to equality before the law by targeting him a black man for prosecution while ignoring the multitude of evidence pointing to three white men as the ones who attacked and killed the Ryan family and Christopher Hughes, the victims of the crimes for which he was convicted and sentenced to death. Worse, these state actors in the Sheriff's Department and the District Attorney's Office destroyed and hid exculpatory evidence and actually manufactured evidence to frame Mr. Cooper. We will list the destruction and planting of evidence and planting of evidence in a minute. Let me start by saying that all of the evidence in this case at the beginning pointed to three white men as the perpetrator of these heinous crimes. On multiple occasions within hours of the attacks, the sole surviving victim, eight-year-old Joshua Ryan, identified his attackers as three white men. This led the sheriff to issue a crime bulletin that is seen on the screen before you, which says that the suspects are three either white or Mexican males, late teens or early 20s, describing one of them wearing a white t-shirt, another a blue short sleeve shirt. This is what they thought 
when they started. But as soon as they found out that Kevin Cooper had been in the vicinity of the crimes, they adopted tunnel vision and stopped searching for those three white men. Let's look at what the evidence was that showed it. It was three white men in addition to what Josh Ryan said. Before you is a map that shows the vicinity of the crimes of the Ryan house. And there were three sightings, which we've shown you on this map, of three white men involved in these crimes. The first sighting was right next to the Ryan home. The second sighting of three white men driving the Ryan station wagon was at sighting number two. And the third and the most important was at sighting three, which is at a bar called the Canyon Corral Bar within a mile and a half of the Ryan's house. Eyewitnesses said that the, those white men in the Canyon Corral Bar who were seen at sighting one and sighting two and at sighting three were wearing bloody clothing. They were matching bloody clothing later recovered within a few hundred meters of the bar by the sheriff. An eyewitness at the bar reported that when two of the men left the bar, they got into a vehicle that fit the description of the Ryan's station wagon, which was stolen that night by whoever murdered the Ryan's. Within days after the murders were discovered, a concerned citizen named Diana Roper turned over to the sheriff bloody coveralls, stating they were worn home on the night of the murders by her white boyfriend, a convicted murderer named Lee Furrow. Diana Roper also stated that on the evening of the murders, her boyfriend, Lee Furrow, wore a shirt identical to the bloody tan t-shirt that was found near the Canyon Corral bar with one of the victim's blood on it. She also reported that Lee Furrow, her boyfriend, his hatchet was identical to the hatchet the sheriff recovered near the crime scene and that she could not find Lee Furrow's hatchet after the murders were discovered. Despite all of this compelling evidence that the crimes were committed by three white men, including Lee Furrow, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department and District Attorney predetermined Mr. Cooper's guilt based upon the color of his skin. They completely disregarded all the evidence pointing to the white killers. And as we'll talk about now, they destroyed withheld and created evidence in order to frame Mr. Cooper for the murders. Just as significant as discussed in Thomas Parker's declaration, which is in your materials that was filed with our papers in advance of this hearing. It's a hearing exhibit four. When the sheriff's office announced to the public that the only suspect in the Ryan Hughes murders was Mr. Cooper, a black man, it caused rampant racial animus throughout San Bernardino County and Southern California. As Mr. Cooper has told you, this extreme public and private racist, racist hatred is embodied in the hanging of a monkey, monkey in effigy outside the courthouse where Mr. Cooper was to be tried. The sign stated, hang the nigger. It should come as no surprise that the state persecuted and prosecuted Mr. Cooper on the basis of his race. For many years, the death penalty has been unfairly applied in the United States to racial minorities, and in particular, when blacks are accused of killing whites. As a result, black Americans make up a disturbing proportion of the individuals sentenced to die in the United States. Specifically, blacks accused of killing white victims are 4.3 times more likely to get the death penalty than blacks killing other races. Such disparities reflect the immense discretion given to local prosecutors to decide whether the death penalty should be sought in a particular case in the United States. I submit, therefore, that Mr. Cooper's Article II rights under the American Declaration have been violated by the acts of the United States. We respectfully ask the Commission to so find in accordance with this Commission's prior findings in the Andrews case.
We will now discuss Articles 18 and 26 of the American Declaration. As recognized by Judge Fletcher and 10 of his fellow appellate judges in an unprecedented dissenting opinion coming out of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, an overview of the evidence in Mr. Cooper's case undermines the soundness of conviction and raises significant doubt as to whether he actually committed the crimes at issue. However, as the 11 judges found, Mr. Cooper has yet to receive a fair hearing before an impartial tribunal that would allow him to fully present this evidence. As recognized by Judge Wardlaw's concurring opinion, which you see on the screen before you, so far as due process is concerned, 24 years of flawed proceedings are as good as no proceedings at all. Because of this, the Commission is empowered to review Mr. Cooper's claims of violations of his right to a fair trial and due process utilizing strict scrutiny in order to determine whether Articles 18 and 26 of the American Declaration have been violated. As to these violations, I will now discuss the inadequacies of Mr. Cooper's defense and governmental misconduct claims. Mr. Heil will then discuss the problems associated with the appellate system in the United States. Mr. Cooper's trial counsel indisputably and unforgivably failed to provide Mr. Cooper an effective defense. Despite the extremely complicated nature of Mr. Cooper's case, as demonstrated by the sheer volume of material produced therein, Mr. Cooper's trial counsel failed to enlist the help of another attorney to aid in the organization and review of that material, which consisted of at least 2,000 pages of documents from the district attorney, 2,000 pages of documents from the sheriff's department, 1,000 photographs, and 100,000 pieces of physical evidence. Rather, Mr. Cooper's defense team consisted of one attorney who was employed by the Public Defender's Office, a state entity, and one investigator. This acute understaffing irreparably handicapped them, resulting in several material mistakes that robbed Mr. Cooper of his right to an effective defense. For example, Mr. Cooper's trial attorney failed to discover the existence of the bloody coveralls and the statements made by Diana Roper about Lee Furrow before the state destroyed those coveralls, even though they were contained within the pages of discovery produced to him. Mr. Cooper's trial attorney also failed to discover the existence of the bloody blue shirt, which was referenced in a police call log that you see before you. The state says that it produced this call log to the defense. However, the defense learned of this shirt 21 years after the crimes occurred. Because of these errors, and likely because trial counsel was overwhelmed, overworked, and suffering from health issues, Mr. Cooper's trial attorney failed to make the connections that would have proven that the crimes were really committed by the three white men, as detailed in the declarations of Thomas Parker and Michael Adelson, as well as Mr. Cooper's merits petition. These deficiencies, which the state has been aware of, but failed to correct, irreparably prejudiced Mr. Cooper's right to an effective defense, thus violating his right to a fair trial and due process, resulting in the need to grant Mr. Cooper a new trial as recognized by the Commission's reasoning in Sankofa. Further, as recognized by the Commission's decision in Telugus, the United States has an enhanced obligation in a death penalty case not to withhold evidence. However, in Mr. Cooper's case, not only did the state withhold evidence, it also destroyed and planted evidence in an effort to frame him. Due to the sheer number of the prosecution's misdeeds and the limited time we have here today, we will only highlight a few instances of government misconduct. However, for the Commission's convenience, we have created the next three slides to document those acts which are detailed in Mr. Cooper's merits brief. First, the prosecution failed to notify Mr. Cooper's counsel of Midge Carroll's statements to investigator. Warden Carroll, who was the warden at the prison that Mr. Cooper had been incarcerated at, told the sheriff that the shoes which Mr. Cooper was accused of wearing 
were actually available to the public and were not prison-issued shoes, as repeatedly argued by the district attorney at trial. Second, Mr. Cooper also wishes to highlight the systematic elimination of evidence pointing to other perpetrators. Contrary to proper law enforcement practices, investigators failed to videotape the interview of the only surviving victim, Josh Ryan, and then destroyed all notes surrounding that interview, allowing the investigating officer to eliminate all references to attackers in the plural in his formal report. However, we know from the supervising psychiatrist that Josh Ryan made multiple references to attackers in the plural during that interview. Finally, the prosecution planted Mr. Cooper's blood on the tan t-shirt that was recovered at the Canyon Corral Bar two days after the discovery of the murders. As proved by blind testing conducted by the state's expert in 2004. However, when that expert learned of the true meaning of his results, he was allowed to withdraw that report under a claim of contamination, a claim that Mr. Attorney, Mr. Cooper's attorneys have never been permitted to investigate. We've put up on the uh, screen a portion of Judge Fletcher's opinion and it talks about how Mr. Cooper was treated in the appellate process in 2004. And it begins, there is no way to say this politely. The district court failed to provide Cooper a fair hearing and flouted our direction to perform the two tests. The two tests were the tests that could have proven that Kevin Cooper is innocent. The problems associated with Mr. Pro Cooper's prosecution have only been compounded by the passage of time and by an appellate process in the United States that fails to deal with innocent cla innocence claims based on evidence found after trial. The U.S. legal system systematically discriminates against exonerating evidence found later within the appellate process. In effect, the prosecution is rewarded the longer they can hide the evidence from the defense. This commission recognized these flaws in the U.S. appellate system in its merits decision in the Telugu's case, paragraph 114. These unfair rules, such as found in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which we put up on the screen, have present, prevented Mr. Cooper from presenting the entirety of the exculpatory evidence and from having a court give full weight to them. He is required by this act to prove that by clear and convincing evidence that no reasonable fact finder would have found him guilty, which changes the balance completely from innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt to having to, the defendant having to prove by clear and convincing evidence that he is innocent. Not only has Mr. Cooper suffered from the draconian restrictions imposed by the AEDPA that require him to show that no reasonable fact finder would have found him guilty, he was a victim of a judge ruling on his most recent habeas corpus petition who, as Judge Fletcher said, abused her discretion and refused to give Mr. Cooper a fair hearing where he could pre pre present his claims. On the screen is another portion of Judge Wardlaw's dissent from the decision not allowing Mr. Cooper to have a fair hearing. And in it, he talks about the failure to do what the court had wanted to do with for, as far as testing is concerned, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's imperative that this commission recognize Mr. Cooper's need for a new trial where he would be able to do the testing which could show that he's in, innocent and where he could present the entirety of the evidence of his innocence and of the state's framing him 
to an impartial fact finder. After all, it took Mr. Cooper many years to learn many of these facts, not through any fault of his own, but because the state successfully concealed them from him. It cannot be that the fundamental rights that Mr. Cooper is entitled to under the American Declaration expire because the state manages to conceal its violations until long into the appellate process. Mr. Cooper's human rights under the American Declaration do not expire with time. As this commission has found in its Telugu's case, if the United States executes Mr. Cooper, despite these blatant human rights violations that we've outlined, it will be, it will be committing another violation by taking his life after he has been denied his rights under the American Declaration to no discrimination, to a fair trial, and to due process. The exigencies surrounding Mr. Cooper's case could not be greater. He is likely to die sometime in 2014 at the hands of the state that already tried to kill him in 2004. It is therefore imperative that the Commission act as soon as possible to issue its merits determination. This will allow us, as his attorneys, to use the Commission's decision in efforts to save Mr. Cooper's life through a clemency petition to the California governor. Governor Brown, through his appointments during his past terms and through statements that he has made, we think is sympathetic to Mr. Cooper and other people on death row. We hope that Governor Brown will pay heed to a decision from this commission that his human rights have been violated. And we suspect that a decision from this commission would help to give the governor a basis to order what Mr. Cooper is entitled to, which is a new trial. Meanwhile, with all due respect to the United States, we submit that because the United States has for nearly two and a half years completely ignored Mr. Cooper's petition and this commission's notices about it, the United States has waived its right to contest Mr. Cooper's allegations. Indeed, through its silence, the United States has admitted its guilt in permitting these human rights violations according to commission rules. Accordingly, we request that the Commission make the following findings on Mr. Cooper's behalf. First, that his rights under Articles 1, 2, 18, and 26 of the American Declaration have been violated by the conduct of the United States. Second, that the only way to rectify those violations is to grant Mr. Cooper a new trial or release him from custody. And third, that intervention by the governor of California in securing a new trial or release of Mr. Cooper is a necessary and appropriate step in remedying, remedying these international human rights violations. Thank you for hearing Mr. Cooper's petition, and we stand ready to answer any questions the commission may have. Thank you very much. Um, I wish to give the United States an opportunity to respond. Um, Deputy Permanent Representative from Vienna. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, distinguished Commissioners, Petitioners, Secretary, colleagues. My name is Lawrence Gumbiner. I am the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United States Mission to the Organization of American States. I am joined here at the table by Ms. Rachel Owen, also of our U.S. Mission, Ms. Margaret Pickering of the State Department's legal staff, and Mr. Andrew Stevenson, also of the U.S. Mission. It is a pleasure for us to be here today. I would like to begin by reaffirming that the United States takes the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its role in the OES very seriously and is committed to addressing with you human rights issues in the hemisphere, including in the United States. We have worked steadfastly in recent years to increase our engagement with the Commission on important human rights issues facing our country. 
We have actively participated in the Commission's meetings, hearings, and expert consultations. We are dedicated to the process and make every effort to ensure the appropriate level of participation to provide the Commission with the opportunity to engage with a full array of policymakers and decision makers in the U.S. government. We take pride in the Commission's role in our region and are open to engagement and welcome the hearings today on these topic of concern to NGOs, to civil society, to the public. However, events in the last month have prevented the United States from preparing sufficiently in order to engage fully as we would like for today's hearing. Consistent with the Commission's rules providing for no less than 30 days notice of hearings, the United States received four notices for hearings on the evening of Friday, September 27, which each included voluminous statements and submissions by interested private persons. Just a few days later, on October 1, most of the U.S. federal government shut down and did not reopen until October 17. This extraordinary event prevented the United States from undertaking full and adequate preparations for the hearings today. With the government closed and most of its employees furloughed, we lost the time essential to engage our interagency colleagues and prepare for these hearings. Many of the specific government agencies with expertise in this matter do not have staff on the job to consider the Commission's communications and insist in preparations. It was for these reasons that on October 8th and again on October 18, the United States sent separate letters to the Commission requesting a postponement of all U.S. hearings and working meetings until the February 2014 session. Please be aware that we made these requests after much consultation and with the understanding that petitioners, NGOs, and the public deserve robust participation from the United States, something we knew would not be possible with such a limited amount of time. The experts from throughout our government who returned to work after more than two weeks of furlough were not able at this late stage to identify witnesses, prepare testimony, gather documentation, and do the work necessary to fully respond to the issues to be raised. Given the sensitive and important nature of the matters before the Commission, and because we take our engagement with the Commission seriously, it typically takes the entire 30-day period for my government to prepare fully researched and coordinated responses. The bottom line is that, unfortunately, today we are not in a position to address the issues raised in your petition. We are here to carefully listen to what the petitioners and the witnesses have to say and to take on board any questions or comments from the Commission. However, since we will not be in a position to provide responses today and sensitive to the time situation of this petition, we propose to follow up in writing within the next 30 days on all of these matters. We welcome an opportunity to appear and discuss these issues as well at a future hearing before the Commission. We would like to thank you for raising these issues and assure you that we will follow up in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wish to acknowledge the presence of my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Rosemary Antoine, who is the commissioner with responsibility for persons of Afro descent and um, against racial discrimination, Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, and Commissioner Rodrigo Escobar Hill, who is the rapporteur for persons deprived of liberty, and also Deputy Executive Secretary Elizabeth Abbey Merced. Um, I wish to indicate before I hand over first to Commissioner Antoine um, that this is a case in which the state has had close to two years to respond um, since the admissibility report in writing to the um, allegations and arguments made by the petitioners. Uh, there are few cases which demand more urgent attention from the state than death penalty case. And the Commission recognizes the commitment of the United States um, to addressing and acknowledging human rights issues. But on the death penalty, the compliance of the United States has been low. There are many um, persons who are the benefit, have the benefit of precautionary measures who have been executed. And in this instance, um, we are disappointed that there isn't um, a full response to the allegations and arguments by the petitioners. 
and would ask that this be treated as a matter of urgency um, in light of the impending possible execution of Mr. Cooper. Um, I wish to first turn over to Commissioner Antoine. Thank you. I would also like to see how unfortunate it is and how distressed we are that in this particular hearing there could not have been a response from the state. Um, I have some sympathy for with the previous hearing, which was a new emerging issue on freedom of expression in the context of security and, and all of that. And one imagines that there would have been some need to have further research. But in this particular hearing, I do believe that there's really very little excuse for the state not being able to give an adequate response, particularly when a person's life and very basic human right um, is in jeopardy, right to life. Um, so that the fact that mere administrative hurdles were allowed to take priority, that I think um, is really, really a very sad situation. This particular matter involves three issues of great importance, death penalty, a uh, right of fair hearing, and of course, the issue of race. In relation to death penalty, the jurisprudence of the International Amer Inter American Commission on Human Rights is well known and well established um, in its revulsion, really, of a death penalty, in particular, where there are, um, there's a strong suspicion, as in this case, of violations of due process. And uh, that is very, very important um, in this particular issue, but in the wider context of a death penalty, um, one would wish to say that international human rights must proceed, in, in organizations must proceed with great caution and with great seriousness on this issue. Also in relation to the right to fair hearing, I just wanted to emphasize that we agree that the right of fair hearing is not limited to first instance, but also the appellate process must accord with uh, human rights, basic human rights must accord with um, the, all of the safeguards and the procedures that one would expect to give equity in the hearing. So I think that is very disturbing to us. Um, it was very um, alarming to me to listen to some of the evidence that was presented today, um, very disturbing. Um, but n not so much, even further in, in relation to evidence, is what I think now is almost uncontested nexus between race and death penalty. And the Commission, and indeed my own rapporteurship, we are very, very concerned about this issue at the Commission. Uh, there have there has been a lot of study, and we welcome the opportunity through this case to make more public our views and our concern about that relationship between race, race discrimination, and death penalty, particularly in the United States, where it concerns persons of African descent. So as the rapporteur, I wanted to say that this is an issue that um, we are very, very, very concerned and disturbed about in relation to the general issue of human rights, and in particular, fair hearing. Thank you. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you. I just would like to stress two issues. The first one, the fact that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is not a criminal tribunal, and as such, it is not its role uh, to determine the culpability or not of a person. Uh, instead, the Commission uh, has the mandate to assess where the human rights of any persons uh, have been uh, affected. And uh, in cases uh, at, at which the, the life of a person is at stake, the Commission uh, takes a very strict approach to make sure that uh, the human rights of a person, uh, of the person that might be executed, uh, have not been affected, particularly in this case the issues of uh, racial discrimination and due process of law. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, if uh, uh, although international law as such uh, doesn't uh, forbids, forbids entirely uh, the application of the death penalty, in fact, it uh, contemplates it only for very exceptional circumstances and after uh, achieving a lot of uh, 
uh, standards and uh, not having affected any human rights of the person that can be executed. Um, the second issue is that uh, um, there is a precautionary measure uh, in this case um, benefiting Mr. Cooper. So although the Commission, as it has stated uh, under its uh, rules of procedure, uh, gives a, a speedy uh, proceeding to the cases of uh, death penalty, despite that part of that fact, the issue is that uh, the state cannot execute Mr. Cooper as long as the, uh, the, the precautionary measure is in place. In the past, the fact that uh, states have executed persons who have uh, um, been beneficiaries of uh, precautionary measures have resulted in very uh, critical uh, situations at the OAS. This happened a few years ago with uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, uh, I'm sure that the United States uh, uh, will have the, the the purpose of uh, uh, fulfilling its obligations and accomplishing with the uh, Commission's uh, precautionary measures. Uh, this has not uh, happened always in the past, uh, but uh, the Commission has stressed that it's very important uh, that the U.S. as our countries uh, do so. Thank you. Rapporteur of Persons Deprived of Liberty, Rodrigo Escobar. I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the petitioners for the information that has been presented. Also, I'd like to thank the state for joining us. And I'd like to join in to, with uh, the comments made by the chairwoman and Rosemary Antoine as well. Rosemary Antoine, that is, with regard to the concern at the fact that there's no response to the points raised by the petitioners. In this case, what is at stake is the life of an individual. And therefore, one must bend over backwards and make do everything possible f to do it for the Commissioner to do its job. As Commissioner Gonzalez said, it, this is not about just assessing evidence or acting as a substitute court in reviewing the evidence in the trial courts of a, of a nation, but rather to determine whether the, the right to a presumption of innocence has been violated, whether there's been a violation of the right to to confront evidence against someone or and the right to present evidence on one's behalf, whether the, Mr. Cooper had indeed access to a technically sound defense, whether the defense that was provided to him was effectively carried out, whether the reason for his conviction was was not for based on racial reasons for all those and other reasons it was very important to hold this hearing which is a which is a preclusive opportunity where information accurate and precise information could be provided to him to for the commission to more properly fulfill its role. I would like to ask the st state, therefore, ask for information from the state to make available to us in the, in the future. What consideration has there been with regard to the precautionary measure issued by the Inter-American Commission as to the life of Mr. Cooper. That's one question I want to specifically pose to the state. And other more general questions I have for the state pertain to the current status of the situation of individuals who are on death row in different 
in different penitentiaries, particularly in the state of Florida. And I saw I'd like information to be gathered and as to the current status of the moratorium of of executions in California. These are the three particular questions: the precautionary measure, death row inmates in other states, and also the execution moratorium in California and the status on these issues. I would like further information on all this. Deputy Executive Secretary. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, two very specific questions perhaps. One is following on the question from Commissioner Escobar uh, and referring to the question of the timing of the possibility to implement the death penalty in California from the information that we have, the general information, the specific information in the case. We had understood that it might be, uh, that the death penalty might be retaken or the possibility to implement it might be retaken by the middle of next year. Um, we were listening to what you said in your presentation that it could be any time in 2014. And so we wanted just to ask about when it may be uh, re-implemented in California. And the other uh, question would be, in your presentation, you referred to the two tests that the district court was directed to carry out and I think you had intended or mentioned that you intended to go back to those, and maybe I missed it, but uh, if I didn't, I was wondering if you could just mention what those were and the significance of those. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Thank you. Uh, let me start with the first one, when the death penalty will be uh, resumed in California. Uh, no one knows for sure. Um, I have always had to work with the worst case scenario, assuming that things will happen faster than, than, uh, than, than later. The situation is that the governor has said because in litigation that my client Kevin Cooper was a plaintiff in uh, that determined that the lethal inje injection regulations were invalid, the governor has said that California is going to reintroduce some and it could happen any day. Now, assuming that that happens any day, there is a process that goes uh, through uh, California law where the regulations have to be uh, vetted to the public and then comments are made and then they become final. Now, that could happen any time this year, although the regulations have been issued, so I can't give you the date on that. Once those regulations are issued, um, there will certainly be challenges to them uh, as there have been to the prior ones, and we don't know how long that will last. So I've always acted on the basis of worst case scenario, and my best uh, guess for the worst case is sometime in the spring of 2014. It could be later, uh, and uh, we simply don't know, but I, I have to go on that basis. I hope that gives you a, a feeling for that. If may, I may add just one thing. When the new death penalty regulations are indeed enacted and passed pursuant to the Administrative Procedure Act and the litigation challenges are filed, there is no guarantee at that point that the court will continue to keep the stays in place that has saved the life of Meth Kevin Cooper and other individuals on California's death row based upon the prior lethal inject injection regulations that have been validated. So I don't want the commission to think that during the process of the challenging of the new lethal injection regulations that Mr. Cooper will necessarily be safe from execution. Responding to the second question, what were the two tests that the Ninth Circuit ordered in 2004? Uh, the, the Ninth Circuit ordered tests uh, in two areas. The first was to determine whether or not the DNA that was found to be from Mr. Cooper's blood on the tan t-shirt and on another piece of evidence called A41 had been planted. And uh, it's a complicated uh, scientific test, but what happened was um, the state's expert did tests 
to determine on a blind basis so the expert did not know what the test would show, whether or not it showed that, in fact, Mr. Cooper's blood had been planted. When the results came back and they were given to the court, they showed that, in fact, the blood had been planted. But the expert then said, oh, I'm sorry, now that I know what the results are, my lab was contaminated, and therefore, please disregard those results. And the district judge, who Judge Fletcher talked about, uh, said, okay, I agree, I'm withdrawing them, and did not allow us to look into whether or not there had been contamination in the laboratory as claimed by the expert. So that was one of the tests. The second test was on hair that had been found in the clutched in the hands of the victims. And the reason for wanting to test this hair was because, uh, by the way, there was no question that none of this hair was African American hair. That's been established. So the question was whether or not the hair belonged to someone who one of the victims had grabbed during the attack and might be able to figure out who that attacker was. And the, the, uh, the, the result of the testing of the hair was that uh, they couldn't determine whose hair it was. But a very significant thing happened as a result of that was not, that no one knew what, uh, was going to happen. The expert who tested the hair did so by getting a blood sample from Mr. Cooper's blood that was taken from him when he was arrested. And what she found was that there was somebody else's DNA in that blood, which supports completely Judge Fletcher's finding that what happened was the state poured some of the blood that they had from Mr. Cooper onto the T-shirt on A41 to plant it and then filled it up with somebody else's so that the vial would be as high with blood as it should have been. And that's what Judge Fletcher found. Now, one of the things that we have asked for is to do these tests in a way where both sides have the ability to give input into how they should be done so we can find out whether or not Mr. Cooper is innocent or not. And the state has refused to allow us to do that testing. And we even went to court and asked the court, and we said, we will pay for this testing, this DNA testing, that might show whose blood is also in the tube that Mr. Cooper's blood is mixed with. And the state fought us at every turn and finally convinced the judge not to allow us to do the testing that we would have paid for. The state probably spent a half a million dollars in attorney's fees to prevent us from doing a test we would have paid for. So what really, the reason we need a new trial here is not just because we think that Mr. Cooper would be found innocent, but if a new trial is started, we would be able to do the testing that we think would show that Mr. Cooper is innocent. Not only by doing this type of testing that was partially done, but withdrawn, but by doing other testing that we've set out in the papers that we filed with you. For instance, um, the hatchet that was found near the scene of the crime has uh, been coated by the prosecution. And our expert has said that if she can remove that coating, we might be able to find whose DNA is on that hatchet ha handle. And maybe we'll find out that it was Lee Furrow who was actually the person who killed the Ryans. Thank you very much, um, petitioners, um, for the information you provided. I had one last question, whether you, this is your first request for clemency. You have asked us specifically, and I just wanted to find out whether there have been any other applications for clemency. The answer is yes. In 2010, Mr. Cooper was told that he was going to, to be executed again. Actually, there are two prior clemency petitions one to uh, Governor Davis, one to Governor Schwarzenegger. Uh, if I could just add one thing to the second one. In his first clemency petition uh, ruling, Governor Schwarzenegger said, Mr. Cooper is guilty as hell, go ahead and execute him. The second one in 2010, after we brought all of this evidence of the planting of, of uh, evidence and the destruction of evidence, 
the Sh Governor Schwarzenegger said, there are very disturbing facts here that need to be looked at. And therefore, I'm passing this on to Governor Brown, who is about to take office. Thank you very much. Um, a final word from the, the government? Thank you, Madam Chair. No, just to reiterate our thanks to the Commission, to the petitioners for uh, bringing these issues before us today, and reiterate our pledge to respond in writing as quickly as possible. Thank you very much um, to the petitioners um, and um, to your client who offered us um, a statement via audio. Um, to the representatives of the state, um, thank you very much. Um, the Commission will be closely following this matter um, and awaiting in the shortest time possible a response from the United States. Thank you.